Uh, good evening everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Jamie McKeough and I'm the Managing Director here at William Buck. Uh, and on behalf of the entire firm, I welcome you here uh, tonight to our uh, seminar on employment taxes and uh, fringe benefits tax uh, update. Uh, fringe benefits tax and employment taxes are a topic that has always been complex, ever changing. So uh, uh, as uh, I have seen the slides, we're, uh, there's, uh, this year's no exception. Uh, we've got a fantastic turnout tonight, a lot of familiar faces. So welcome to those uh, of you who uh, do know us and uh, a special welcome to those of you who are visiting William Buck for the first time. Before we start a few housekeeping matters, if you can turn your mobile phones to silent and if you do require the bathrooms, they're back uh, down past reception and on the left. Um, at the conclusion of our presentation, uh, we'll have some drinks and food, so um, everyone's very welcome to, uh, to uh, stay around and uh, chat afterwards. Um, in a moment, I'll formally introduce our speakers um, this evening. Andrew Nicola, who is um, one of our tax directors, and James King, a tax principal. Um, but before I do, I'll just uh, take a couple of minutes to introduce William Buck to those of you who do not know us. Um, tonight we're here to talk about tax, but there's a lot more to William Buck than just tax. Um, and since coming back from lockdown last June, we've seen really strong um, levels of growth across uh, the entire firm, but in particular our specialist divisions being audit, corporate advisory and tax. That along with our business advisory and wealth advisory practices uh, in conjunction with our finance advisory and broking um, that continue to offer an integrated um, service and innovative approach uh, to managing our clients' affairs uh, has also um, experienced some strong growth, which is good. Our firm is uh, currently 21 directors and around 180 staff, making us the third or fourth largest firm in Adelaide. Um, we're part of the William Buck network across Australia and New Zealand, which comprises 100 directors and 800 staff, giving us access to significant um, depth of resources and experience, which ultimately benefits our clients. And if your business is expanding offshore, we're at, we are part of the sixth largest accounting group across um, the globe. Uh, with representation in more than 120 countries. So as a group of um, finance professionals dealing with highly complex matters, um, please think of us if you have uh, the need beyond uh, what you'll be hearing about um, tonight. I'm sure we can help you out. Um, operating as we do uh, across a lot of businesses, we're often asked how we're seeing uh, business. And um, I'm sure you may be interested in, in those observations. We team up with Business SA every quarter and uh, for a quarterly survey of business confidence in South Australia. And the most recent um, December quarter survey, uh, which is of several hundred South Australian businesses, revealed the following. The business confidence is above pre-COVID levels and is above the 10-year average. Uh, around one third of businesses said that 2020 um, year was either their best result ever financially or best in the last five years. So that was a third of businesses. 35% of businesses said that their business was functioning better than pre-COVID, um, whether that be as a result of efficiency gains, cost reductions, and um, just having time to review business systems and strategy. At the other end of the spectrum, there were around 15% of businesses that had had a reduction in their turnover of above 50% as a result of COVID and they're the obvious ones in industries most impacted by government restrictions being events, hospitality, international travel and corporate travel. But the biggest issue that came out uh, as um, facing businesses at the moment was actually access to labour and whether that was skilled or unskilled labour uh, businesses are struggling to find people, which if we wind the clock back uh, 12 months when the predictions for our unemployment rate across Australia were 15%, um, then it's a, a very um, distant um, uh, position to, uh, to what, was being ex what was expected. So in summary, businesses are performing very well and we're absolutely seeing that with, um, with our clients and, and I think possibly better than those survey results and it is across most industries um, but all businesses, whether in the survey or our own, 
do remain cautious about the medium term and whether um, what we're seeing now has been brought forward by the huge stimulus packages um, that uh, we've seen at a state and federal level. Uh, with that, I'd now like to introduce both our presenters. Um, firstly, Andrew Nicola is the director here at William Buck and heads our tax services division. Andrew joined us about 10 years ago from KPMG. He advises a range of clients across a number of different industries and works closely with CFOs, boards and business owners when navigating through tax risks and taking advantage of opportunities. Andrew has a strong background in all areas of FBT and employment taxes. Our second speaker, James King, joined William Buck in January, having more than 15 years of corporate tax experience with Deloitte. James specialises in corporate tax consulting and compliance, international tax, tax effect accounting, fringe benefits tax, salary packaging and employment taxes. And specifically on FBT, has assisted clients in preparing FBT policy manuals, FBT private rulings and assisted with ATO reviews. He advises public, multinational and large private clients across a diverse range of industries, both of whom our speakers tonight, um, I believe, um, form part of the best tax team in Adelaide. Maybe I'm a little biased, um, but uh, that's the way I see it. So with that, I'll uh, introduce Andrew to, uh, to, uh, to his presentation. Thanks, Andrew. Well, thank you, James, for that very warm welcome. Uh, before I kick off and start today's presentation, uh, I've got a confession, uh, admission to make. I'm really excited about today's presentation, and it's not necessarily to do with the topic. I do like FBT, and I do like advising clients on FBT, but uh, I'm excited by the fact that I won't have to say one of the following. Uh, I think your mic's turned off. Um, I think um, <laughs> anyone who isn't talking, can you please turn off their mic? And lastly, importantly, um, which is an issue for me, Skype kicked me off this call. So. Um, that's what I'm most excited about today and I appreciate everyone coming into the office to, to hear us talk about FBT and employment taxes. So as you can see with the, um, with the pack in front of you and the, and the contents page, there's a little bit to get through. And um, this year, this FBT season is going to be uh, a little bit different to the previous years and you'll see a bit of a theme and there's a bit of a take home message in that if we follow the same methodology, the same valuation techniques uh, to fringe benefits, that we did in the previous year, there's a risk that we're actually going to pay more FBT. And an example of that's entertainment for, um, uh, an example is entertainment. It's likely that everyone's entertainment expenditure has dropped this year. And if we use 50-50 in the previous year and apply that just because that's what we've done in previous years to this year and not use actual, we actually may pay more FBT. So just keep that in mind when you're pairing FBT returns of looking at um, the FBT return uh, for the 2021 financial year. And we've got a few more examples of that throughout today's presentation. This slide covers key dates and rates, and as you can see, uh, nothing has really changed uh, dramatically or at all in respect to key uh, rates. In respect to dates, the ATO has granted a concession in that they've extended the tax payment from um, what was traditionally 28th of May, if you lodged through a tax agent, to now 25th of June. So the tax payment date is also now the same as the tax lodgement date if you lodge with a tax agent, which is handy. So you won't have to worry about the wash up of uh, tax payments at the end of, uh, you know, close to the lodgement date. Now I'll dive straight into recent FBT changes. I think it's important to revisit how the FBT Act actually operates. Um, it, it operates to treat all non-cash benefits um, that provides employees to fall within the FBT net. So anything we provide to an employee that's non-cash falls in the FBT net, and then we need to work out what exemption we can apply to drag it back out. So I think it's important to have that lens when we're looking at, um, or when we're talking about this presentation today, because often, sometimes employers might think, well, I gave that employee that desk or that monitor to work from home, um, or that laptop so they can work from home. That's a work-related item. FBT has nothing to do with it. I want you to consider it. Well, it's not necessarily true. It falls within the FBT net, and we need an exemption to drag it back out. So you see that when, uh, throughout today's presentation. So the first item I'd like to talk about is um, 
A uh, new exemption has been announced as part of the ATO or the uh, government's response to COVID. So broadly, um, this exemption encourages employers by providing an FPT exemption on costs to retrain, reskill staff who've been made redundant or would soon be made redundant or uh, re-employed within the organisation. So the, previously retraining and reskilling employee could expose the employer to FPT as they may not be able to access the otherwise deductible rule. Now, I appreciate there's probably a range of um, sort of knowledge levels here today, so just to briefly explain what the otherwise deductible rule is. It's basically a concession or exemption that allows the employer not to be subject to FBT had the employee, if they theoretically incurred that cost, was allowed to a once-off deduction. So I think that's all best explained in an example. So in the example that uh, Jamie tomorrow taps me on the shoulder and says, Andrew, I like what you're doing but not in tax anymore, mate. I think you should uh, move into IT, otherwise your job's gone, which um, is a crazy example because uh, my IT skills are terrible. <laughs> um, and that incurred um, $1,500 of IT training costs in a, in a, in a training session. To, in order for that FBT, in order for that cost to be FBT exempt, they would look to the otherwise deductible rule, and then you'd look to see whether I could claim a personal tax deduction in my own name. Well, if I include occur those costs in my own name, well, that has nothing really to do with my income producing activities. There's no nexus there. So it's unlikely that I'll be eligible for a tax deduction. And as a result, unfortunately, it would be FBT, it wouldn't be subject, it would be subject to FBT and not FBT exempt. So this concession when enacted would, would effectively plugs up a hole within the FBT legislation. It's important to note that this uh, this exemption doesn't apply to uh, study package arrangements or uh, Commonwealth supported placements, so university courses. The next key change um, relates to the definition of taxi. Effectively, the definition of taxi has been expanded, and in a nutshell, it includes ride sharing vehicles such as Uber. So, this is important because there's an FBT exemption out there that um, exempts, FB, um, exempts from FBT taxi travel between home and work, or because it's required because the employee is sick because um, they have to go home because they're unwell or go to the hospital because they're unwell. So previously a cost incurred by an uh, employer to travel, uh, for an employee to travel uh, home to work. Um, um, so for example, if uh, work gave a cab charge to an employee to travel back home uh, because they were working late or were unwell, that cab charge would be FBT exempt. But prior to the introduction of this legislation, the costs under an Uber wouldn't be. So effectively, um, this legislation brings the FPT system up to speed what's happening in the real world, they're both, both the same thing. The next change I'll run through is probably the biggest of the presentation, right? It relates to change to the car parking French benefits regime. So there's, there's two key changes here. One is the ATO has expanded their interpretation of what constitutes a commercial parking station. Now I've got to be really careful here without saying the word parking throughout the next three slides about 50 times. I'll try my best. <laughs> but it's gonna be hard to do. Um, I've got a dedicated slide to that and that's probably the biggest issue. The second point is there's been expansion of the small business car parking exemption and I've got another slide and I'll explain that in a bit more de detail. I think it's firstly important uh, to understand what is considered a car parking fringe benefit. When does it actually arise? So for a car parking fringe benefit to arise, all of the following, um, all of the following points listed on, on screen need to be satisfied. But in my opinion, there's three real key points. Um, if you satisfy those, satisfy those three, the others are likely to have been satisfied. So the first one is the employer's car is parked on an employer provided parking space. So there's two clear examples of that. And one example is an employer leases three or four car parks at a U park and lets employees park there. Well, that's an employer provided parking space. It's quite clear. The next example is on site car parking. So um, uh, William Buck, for example, had there been a, um, a car park underneath the building and had they uh, let staff use that car park, that's an employer provided car parking. Um, um, that's employer provided car parking and would satisfy the first requirement. The next key requirement is the car is parked within a one kilometre radius of a commercial parking station. So that's, that's fundamental and that really ties back into the ATO's expansion of what's considered a commercial parking station. So really any employer in a city, if they, provide, if they satisfy the first point, would likely satisfy the second point because it's going to be a commercial parking station, a U park or equivalent within 1k of their premise. The third po important point in my opinion is the parking space is used for more than four hours 
on the day between on any day between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. So we need actually employees using the car park. And that's particularly important when you're using certain valuation methodologies, particularly the actual method. And I'll talk about that later on in my presentation. So if you satisfy those key three points, then I dare say you have a car parking fringe benefit. We need to look at whether exemptions apply and if exemptions do not apply, whether we can apply an appropriate valuation to mitigate the FBT liability that could arise. <clears throat> so of the two changes I, I briefly discussed, firstly, I'll run through the ATO's expanded view of what is a commercial parking station. So in my opinion, this will impact employers the most who don't have premises within the city and never really need to consider car parking fringe benefits. Because usually if you have a premise within the city and you have something to do with car parking, you've considered car parking fringe benefits before. But people that are up at Edinburgh, for example, or uh, you know, far away, you know, not, not in the city, probably will usually haven't had the need to consider um, uh, whether they're triggering car parking fringe benefits if they allow staff to park on site. That's potentially changed with this expansion in, of um, the commissioner's view. So in a nutshell, the Commissioner's proposed revised view through a draft ruling which is not finalised is that a car parking facility will be considered a commercial parking station even if the main purpose is not to provide all-day parking and its fee structure discourages all-day parking with high fees. So this departs from a previous position where car parks like this were not really considered commercial parking stations. So I think this is best described in an example. So my local supermarket, my local uh, shopping centres, uh, West Lakes. And the main purpose of going to that or parking my car there is to facilitate shopping. It's not really to park my car there for long periods of time and then go to work. It's not designed as an all day car parking place. And that's highlighted by the fact the first two hours are free. <clears throat> and then after that you pay, you pay. And, and after each hour it, it goes up to the point where it's quite expensive to deter people to leave their car there to ensure that there's enough car parks for everyone to go in, do their shop and leave. So that's a key issue here. That drags in public car parks located at shopping centres, hospitals, airports, which could now meet the definition of a car parking uh, station. So the key, what we're talking to a number of clients about is to understand where all your sites are and work out whether there's a commercial car parking station near those sites. So, um, and if there is, work out whether you can access a small business exemption, which I'll talk about uh, in the next slide. And if not, work out how you value those car park fridge benefits that are now provided in a manner that's um, um, in a manner that mitigates uh, FBT because it's not it's not a great obviously fringe benefit when you're providing um, on-site car parking. Now all of a sudden you have to pay FBT on that as well. So on this slide, I thought it'd be useful to just get the brain thinking about. Well, some people might say, "Oh, it definitely doesn't impact me," um, but as an, we just listed some. Um, car parking facilities here, there's obviously not an exhaustive list, which could come into, um, could meet the definition of a commercial parking fac facility. Now, we're talking to one client that um, is close to the line of human hospital up at Edinburgh, and that's a pretty industrial area. Now, all of a sudden, <laughs> they provide on site car parking, there is a car park uh, facility there. They potentially may now be charging, um, maybe subject to FBT on on site car parking that uh, they provide to staff when uh, previously it wasn't because of this change in interpretation. So the next change I'll talk about is the expanded definition of small business car parking exemption. So this is how you get out of the net, uh, uh, the car park infringement benefits rules. So from 1 April 2021, businesses with aggregate turnover of less than 50 million can asset, uh, access existing small business car parking uh, concessions. The existing small business concessions allow car parking benefits to be exempt where the parking's on site and not provided on a commercial parking station. There's other requirements there as well, but the key thing is you have to provide on site. As soon as you provide a commercial, as soon as you provide someone with the ability to park on a U park, well, you can't get this exemption. Previously, or any entities with turnover of less than 10 million could access this. So this is a good thing. This is an expansion. We've got a few clients that operate in a city which provide on site car parking on city fringes that now can access this exemption and um, we won't be paying car parking fringe benefits anymore, which is really good. I should note that some uh, taxpayers are actually naturally exempt from car parking fringe benefits, that include schools and other certain not-for-profits. So now I'll run through um, how COVID-19 has impacted FBT, and particularly fringe benefits, um, certain benefits provided. 
So over the next few slides, we'll discuss uh, the provision of work-related items, which I think is going to be a hot topic for everyone in FBT season because of the lockdowns, people obviously have been working from home. I just want to highlight that an FBT exemption applies where an eligible work-related item, which includes a portable uh, electronic device, so your laptops, your mobile phones, your um, iPads, uh, a briefcase, protective clothing, they all fit within the definition of a work-related item, is provided to an employee. So that's exempt when it's primarily for the use of an uh, employee's employment, and it's not a duplicate or something with a substantially identical function already. So um, if we're Effectively, we can't provide multiple laptops to the same person or a laptop and an iPad, potentially, if they have the same sort of function. But this duplication rule doesn't apply if it's a replacement item. So if you've got a clumsy person like myself that continually breaks laptops, I don't, but just as an example, um, then the duplication rule doesn't apply. Or alternatively, if the employer is a small business. So if the employer is a small business, then multiple phones can be provided as an example. Um, and, and it won't be subject to FBT. So for the 2021 FBT year, to be considered a small business entity, aggregate turnover needs to be less than 10 million. However, from 1 April 2021, i.e. the 2022 FBT year, aggregate turnover threshold increases to 50 million, which is useful. Another, um, another uh, it's important to know that that work-related exemption, which I just discussed here, doesn't really include monitors, uh, it's, it's a defined list, it doesn't include monitors, desks, chairs, etc. So um, we need to look at another exemption to apply when we're providing staff with a full workstation, as an example. And that's what I'll talk about now. So employees who allowed the use of a work-related item, so or provide work-related items, desks, uh, you know, a chair, certain monitors, etc., during a lockdown, really need to consider the FBT application. So of what they're providing, and that goes back to well, everything's in the FBT net. We, we need to work out how to drag it out with an exemption. So. I think this is best explained an example. So in Adelaide, there's obviously two, uh, two lockdowns. There was a normal Australia lockdown, and then there was the, the pizza gate that happened in November. So if I, if I use the pizza gate as an example, and I use my own uh, situation, uh, after panic buying in the markets, I came back here and, and I'm joking. Um, <laughs> and I looked at, well, what do I need to, to bring home, uh, to work at home? Because the pessimist in me thought, well, this is gonna be like Melbourne, I'm gonna be here forever, and that obviously wasn't the case. Um, so I took, my uh, laptop, obviously, my phone, that's covered by the, um, the exemption I spoke about previously. I uh, took a box of uh, pens and, and, um, and some highlighters, and then I, I didn't do this, but uh, I took my, say I took my monitor, I took my chair, and I wheeled my, my, um, my stuff down to my car, and I saw a bunch of other people doing the same sort of thing. And I didn't think to myself, oh, I wonder what the FBT implications were at that stage. I thought, geez, I wonder if I've got enough toilet paper, but <laughs> I speak truthfully. But there are FBT implications with respect to this. Um, so if work only let me use my monitor and my chair and you know, say they let me use a desk as well, they sent out a desk, then it's likely that FBT, or FBT won't be triggered. The reason for that is there's a specific exemption for where the use of a property, e.g. a desk or a chair, is granted to an employee which is normally located on business premises and it's primarily used for business purposes. So my desk and my chair, my monitor, and that, that's, that would satisfy the requirement. If for whatever reason we can't satisfy the requirement, I would have thought the minor benefits exemption or the otherwise dark rule would apply because the value of the use of my chair for a three month period, as an example, would likely be less than $300, unless it's a really nice chair, which is not the case. <laughs> so use of office equipment, likely not to be FBT. Different story if we're, being, if we're providing staff with uh, office equipment. Um, the key issue is we can't, so we're giving it to them. So it's not a residual benefit like the use is, it's a property fringe benefit or an expense fringe benefit. An expense fringe benefit could arise if they, if they went out to office works and bought a nice new monitor and said, oh, William Barkheim or whoever employer, I need, I need this for work purposes, repay me. So that's an expense fringe benefit. Property fringe benefit is if we give them the monitor. The key issue here is the minor benefits exemption or the otherwise the doctor will need to, need, to, need, to, um, need to apply for it to be FPT exempt. The key issue is, well, if that's a pretty flash monitor or a flash chair or a flash desk, it's probably gonna be over 300. So therefore we can't use the minor benefits exemption. And the other requirement is, um, is under the otherwise the doctor rule was, was, could that employee claim a tax deduction for those items, a once off immediate tax deduction for those items had they incurred the expansion themselves? And I would argue potentially that these employees will need to depreciate those items, not claim it outright. So I think 
in both those situations, if it's more than three hundred dollars, we've got some we've got we've got some issues that we need to navigate through. So something just to be aware of. And you might think, well, that's a big deal. It's a you know, one monitor for three hundred and thirty dollars. Well, if that's over thirty employees, that can clock up pretty quick. So the next area I'll talk about is car fringe benefits, and this is obviously a hot topic every year. And, and this year's no other. In fact, it's going to be. Uh, we're going to have to review our car fringe benefits in a bit more detail this year, in my opinion, and I'll explain why. So we need to consider the impact of COVID-19 on the use of the car. There's, there's two key issues here or considerations. A car fringe benefit is deemed to arise when the car is garaged or kept near uh, a place of residence. That's under a deeming rule, and that particularly applies under the statutory method, the easy method that you know, it's commonly used because it's easy to do or we have high private use. Next key issue is travel may actually have been impacted by lockdowns and we'll question whether we can use our lockbooks or not. And uh, James will touch on that in a bit of detail later. So the key action here is to review each car individually. Consider both the statutory and the operating cost method, the two key methods to value a car fringe benefit. And don't follow last year's trim just because it worked last year. It may not work this year. Uh, if we can do the operating cost method, let's look at that, calculate that, calculate the stat method and see which one works better. So to assist in this review, what I'm, what I'm telling staff and I'm telling clients is we need to th think of uh, a pool of cars, no pun intended, um, into three key categories. The first one is cars with a high amount of private use. They're likely to be on an evaded lease potentially, and there's not much we can do there. We'll probably use a stat method because it's high private use, we don't have a logbook. And even if we had a logbook, it would probably say there's a high amount of private use. Um, so those cars that were parked at home during lockdown, well, we're going to have to pay a fee on that. The next, next uh, pool uh, or, or category of cars is tool of trades, so our utes, our vans. And if that was exempt last year, it's likely to be exempt this year. The reason for that is our tr treatment's going to remain um, unchanged, even if they do park it at home, because home to work travel is exempt, providing you meet certain requirements, um, the, the use of the vehicles minor and frequent for the private uses. The most important category what I'm, where I recommend uh, clients look at is when there's a mixture of both business and private. This year, the logbook method in many cases may actually provide a better result. This is particularly the case when we factor in the ATO's concession that they introduced in, uh, via a fact sheet, which I'll explain right now. So the ATO states that under this fact sheet concession, where a car hasn't been driven at all for a, period, for a lockdown period, or is only driven for maintenance purposes, the ATO will accept that a car has not been held for, uh, uh, for the purpose of providing a fringe benefit. So that's pretty important. So no fringe benefits can arise during, uh, during that instance. But it's only the case if the following requirements are, are, are met. So the operating cost method is applied, so we need a logbook. Uh, we need to maintain a written election. That doesn't necessarily need to be provided to the ATO. We just need to have that before we lodge our fee return. And probably the most important, well, the most important and, uh, and the most difficult is we need some sort of dominant readings or proof that we may, uh, to maintain evidence that the car was only really driven for maintenance purposes and you know, wasn't being driven around. I want to highlight this is a genuine concession because if you can access this, all operating costs during that period will be excluded from the um, calculation. So employers can effectively ignore the use of the car during that period. So all your operating costs like your, your deemed depreciation, deemed interest, um, your repairs, um, which probably aren't a lot during that period, and petrol probably shouldn't be a lot during that period because you shouldn't have been driving much. Um, your rego insurance during that period are effectively exempt. Now, the impact of this benefit will vary from employer and employer, particularly where they're located. So as an example, we have a client in Melbourne who has a fleet of sales staff and obviously Melbourne had one of the longest lockdowns in the world. Those, that, those sales team were grounded. They all have logbooks with high amount of business use. Um, so this concession will be really valuable for them to ensure that the time that those cars were not being used and parked in the garage, no FBT has been incurred. And the quantum is in the thousands. So the key areas to consider, in my opinion, in respect to this are, do third parties calculate our car fringe benefits, like Toyota Finance or Maxia, um, and do they have all the relevant details to access this concession? Uh, I do want to know, it's probably unlikely that if we're getting Toyota Finance, for example, to calculate the fringe benefits that they're using the operating cost method, but I have seen it a few times, usually when we ex uh, engage external providers, you know, they use the stat method because it's high private use. 
But I have seen it, so uh, if we're looking to gain this concession, we need to engage them. The next, and probably more important, is for cars that historically do not have logbooks, and there is business use, is there an opportunity to access the concessions and prepare a logbook for the 2021 FPT year? So I've got a question mark there. Theoretically, theoretically yes, we can, providing we start today, <laughs> being the end of the FPT year, or sometime earlier today. Again, to have a valid logbook, it needs to run for 12 continuous weeks um, to apply that in the 31st of uh, March 2021 FPT uh, return. And it needs to be finalised before the due date. So if I, my math is correct, if we started today, it won't be finalised before the due date being the 28th of June. So we need to lodge an extension. So if we get an extension and uh, it's granted, and our logbook's finalised before that extended due date, then theoretically, yes, we can use a logbook and apply this concession. So I'd be reviewing what cars are, have a mixture of business and private use, see whether a logbook can be um, uh, uh, created, can be used, can be accessed. Um, and ensure those requirements are met to see whether we can access this concession. Another hot topic every year, but again, more importantly, this year is entertainment. So our, our firm's the same um, as many other businesses. Then uh, there was changes in the nature and particularly the frequency of entertainment provided in 2021. Either we had lockdowns or and we couldn't really, really entertain or it wasn't the um, there wasn't the appetite or the appropriateness to go out entertaining, particularly when there was um, you know, capacity limits at bars and pubs and whatnot. Um, so having said that, we, we're strongly recommending the actual method is considered as well as the 50-50 method this year. So if we did 15-50 method every year because we don't have the data to look at actual, I'd be flipping that on the head this year and spending some time if we can to get the details to work out, well, what is the actual fringe, uh, benefit, liability, applying two key concessions. One being the minor benefits exemption, which we can apply if we use the actual, and the property consumed on employer's premises exemption. Now, that's probably not going to be as useful this year because it's unlikely we entertained a lot with employees here uh, on, on premises. The reason for that is a lot of employees work from home, depending on what your business was, what the business does. But the minor benefits exemption is going to be a big one. Um, uh, as described on, on the slide, you know, less than $300 inclusive GST per person is a requirement and it needs to provide it irregularly and infrequently. So that goes to the age old question as to what's considered infrequent and irregular. Um, happy to share my personal view is, uh, I think once a month, it would be hard for the ATO to say once a month is not, is, is too frequent or too, too or is too frequent. And providing um, it's not state Fridays and we go out every Friday <laughs> and have, um, have go out for entertainment every Friday um, uh, on that, on the last Friday of a month, then I think it'd be hard to say that it's uh, not irregular if we just, went out once a month. Now, that's not to say that it can't be a higher number. The ATO have an old ruling which seems that suggests that the minor frequent rule can be applied up to 20 times. Um, the example was um, 20 times could be applied. Um, the example was an employee uh, incurred toll costs and, um, and clocked up to 20 times and that was considered minor frequent. My personal view is there's a difference between toll costs and entertainment when you're applying a minor benefits exemption, because toll costs, the cost of that's next to nothing versus a meal that could be quite expensive providing it's not more than 300. So I think it's safe to say if it's 12 times per employee in a year, you'd, you'd be okay. Uh, an important point is cancellation costs and non-refundable deposits. There, if we incur those costs, um, because we had to cancel end of year financial show, for example, um, there's no PT implications because we haven't actually provided anything to an employee but however, the costs still have that nature of entertainment and as they do, we can't unfortunately claim an income tax deduction and the GST input tax credits cannot be claimed either because um, it has that entertainment flavour, which is a bit frustrating. Finally, although not entertainment, um, you know, um, they're likely to be property or property fringe benefits, any gift, I know a number of um, employees, including William Buck, gave gift cards this year and, and to, to staff and and uh, your hand as a thank you because it was a tough year in the 20, uh, 20 uh, calendar year. That's not really entertainment, that's a property fringe benefit to give a gift card or, or, a, um, or a hamper. Um, so the exemption that we need to look at is a minor benefits exemption. So I want to come back to uh, car parking fringe benefits. Um, similarly to entertainment, I strongly suggest uh, employers revisit how they value car parking fringe benefits, if you have them. 
Um, so by way of background, the two common methods uh, used to calculate the number of car park fringe benefits are the statutory method and the actual method. Now, um, the actual, uh, the statutory method is a common method because it's easy. It basically deems a car park has been provided 228 days, which is the number of work days in an FBT year. Nice and easy, a lot of employers use that, particularly if there's, you know, for example, eight car parks and, and on site and 50 employees, it's likely the car park's been used. <laughs> um, that can be reduced, uh, in, in particular this year should be considered, that can be reduced where no car park infringement benefit arises. And that could arise where there's no commercial car parks with a 1K radius, for example, they've been closed, or uh, they offer free or heavily reduced uh, car parking. So that's unlikely to have occurred in Adelaide because we didn't have those harsh lockdowns um, like Melbourne did. But for clients in Melbourne, they're gathering data using data analytics tools to work out well, where their car park fringe benefit had occurred on that day because there was huge incentives to get people to come to the city. A, car park may have been closed because it wasn't deemed as a, uh, essential and B, uh, expanding out of that, um, it was really hard to get employees to come to the city. So arguably there, um, uh, arguably there could be no car park infringement for that arose. What I'll suggest clients do is really revisit the actual method this year um, if we use the statutory formula in previous years. The reason for that is um, it's actually based <laughs> based on the number of uh, benefits provided in a year, so the actual number. And similarly, we can exclude um, the days where a commercial parking station was closed or offered free uh, car parking, but importantly, excludes the days that employee didn't actually utilize that car park. So because Adelaide actually had a lockdown um, and staff um, work from home, or staff may have worked from home, the car parks may have remained empty. Uh, empty. So if we have car parks at a U park, we, we need to get, I'll suggest to get to try to determine how we gather that data to work out where the car park was used. And I know clients are contacting the relevant car parking, um, uh, relevant car park to work out whether they can uh, track data for particular swap cards to work out whether the boom gate actually opened and closed for that car park that day. I know uh, some client, what we're suggesting clients is to review your own internal scanning cards if you have it to work out whether the employee actually rocked up or actually went to work that day. The employee didn't scan the building, it's likely they didn't use the car park in the first place, so therefore car park infringement didn't rise under the action method. And thirdly, uh, for example, engineering firms I know use timesheets to track whether an employee worked from home or not. So if recorded correctly in the timesheet that the employee worked from home, then the car park infringement benefit wouldn't arise on the action method. And given that for some employers, there's still quite a few employees working from home, I strongly recommend we gather that data and work out whether the action method uh, is appropriate to use. Uh, finally, some employers reimburse daily car parking fees to encourage employees to return back to the office. That's not a car parking fringe benefit. That's a car parking expense payment. So um, it's, like, it's just an expense payment. And we need to consider the minor benefits exemption for that. So not the, the valuations that I spoke about previously. I'll quickly skim over the slide because I've probably, I've probably uh, stretched over time, but I just want to highlight that there's this um, COVID-19, <laughs> logically by the ATO, has been considered an emergency. And as part of the bushfires, there's this emergency assistance package or, or expenditure that can be incurred long to short term to assist employees in an emergency. Tying that to COVID could be um, incurring costs for isolation. So if, if whatever an employer brought back someone uh, from overseas or interstate and there were costs incurred in, in self-isolating at, at a medical hotel and the employer paid for that, then I would say arguably we can apply this exemption. So probably not too applicable, just highlight that it's out there. So that concludes my part of the presentation. I hand you over to James who will uh, go up the second part. Thank you. Evening everyone. Okay, so my first topic is strategies to manage your FBT obligations. So really what we want to ensure are two things, that you apply all available exemptions and concessions, but also reduce the compliance burden, because for FBT, it is a real compliance burden um, on employers. The first one's about um, uh, otherwise deductible rule, 
Andrew talked about that reduction that's available. Generally to apply, you need substantiation from the employee. You need a declaration to show what um, the otherwise deductible was eligible. However, a declaration is not required for exclusive employee benefits. And that's broadly where the benefit, if it was incurred by the employee, uh, was incurred exclusively in gaining their salary income. And, um, and that means 100% otherwise deductible. So examples of that are where uh, an employer reimburses an employee's CA uh, annual membership or CPA annual membership, that should be uh, considered an exclusive employee benefit. So no declaration required. Another idea to reduce your compliance burden is with policies. So the otherwise deductible rule, it's a reduction, but there is a similar exemption that can apply. And that is where there's a consistently enforced policy in place and basically says that the employer is only going to reimburse items um, that are 100% work related. So 100% uh, eligible for the otherwise deductible rule. So you need the policy in place that says, as an employer, I'm only going to reimburse these costs. And then once a year, the employer has to sign one single declaration to say that there's no private use. So rather than trying to catch employees to get them, um, all their declarations, you just have to do one. So there's clear benefits with that. Again, it's an exemption rather than a reduction. So you don't actually have to disclose anything on the FBT return either. So there's a lot of less tracking involved to um, an analysis. Uh, some employers might provide in-house benefits. So as an example, a brewery might give discounted beer to their staff. In that example, that's an in-house property fringe benefit. Again, the ATO has confirmed that where you have a staff discount policy for your in-house benefits that you provide to the employees, and, and under that policy, if the amount the employee pays is always greater than the taxable value of that fringe benefit, then the employer doesn't have to track those benefits and you don't have to disclose anything in the FBT return. Now, a key part of this is that with in-house benefits, there's different valuation methodologies that apply. So if you want to apply this concession, I guess the important work out is how do we calculate the taxable value of these in-house benefits that you want to apply? And then from there, work out what the staff discount will be to ensure that there's no adverse FBTN outcomes. I've seen this work before. I've seen this work in respect to an ATO review. The ATO is fine with it, and it does save employers a lot of time. Um, again, with in-house benefits, there's the aggregated $1,000 reduction per employee. So for all benefits, um, in-house benefits provided in the year. Car fringe benefits, Andrew's touched, and touched on some strategies and hints. Firstly, for each car that you provide for each year, you can compare the stat formula method or the op, um, operating cost method to see which has the best outcome um, per car. With the stat formula method, try and identify the days the car was not available for private use. So whether the employee was on leave, they parked the car at the uh, business premises, that should reduce your FBT liability. With the operating cost method, we talked about needing a compliant logbook so crucially, with the operating cost method, a compliant logbook is basically the gateway to use this valuation methodology. Once you have the compliant logbook, then you're able to use the operating cost method, but you don't necessarily need to apply the business use percentage in that logbook. If the business use percentage is higher for that year, then you're allowed to apply a higher percentage for the operating cost method but you just need to work out or be able to demonstrate how you can prove that. Now, the ATA is not asking for a logbook. It might just be diary entries, travel diaries of employees, um, but just something to think about where if an employee does have a logbook and it's got a low business use, you're not fixed to use that, um, that percentage. Um, and then lastly, with work-related vehicle exemptions, again, Andrew touched on that. There is an exemption where you have a certain type of work-related vehicle. Home-to-work travel is exempt, um, and so is minor private use. There's a PCG, PCG 2018-3, which talks about the ATO's compliance approach. Applying that PCG is not mandatory. 
you can still adopt this exemption even if you don't meet the very, very narrow requirements of that PCG. So the ATO has given very, very narrow requirements that say, if the employee's private use is this, you're allowed to use the exemption. Well, I would say 95% of taxpayers would have you private use beyond what the ATO is um, outlining there in the PCG. So it's not mandatory. You just need to be able to demonstrate why the exemption um, is able to be applied. So showing that their actual private use was minor and infrequent. Okay, ATO audits and reviews. We can't really talk about ATO activity without touching on streamlined assurance reviews and then also the ATO's increased emphasis on the importance of tax governance frameworks. Over the last few years, the ATO has been undertaking a lot of streamlined assurance reviews, particularly at listed multinational taxpayers. But that approach is now trickling down to the larger private groups um, as well as the importance of tax governance frameworks. I've listed three types of private groups um, that the ATO categorises, uh, the top 500, so that's the 500 largest private groups, turnover greater than 350 million a year. The next 5,000 though, to the next 5,000 below that top 500, turnover of between 50 and 350 million a year, wealth of about 50 million for the family, and then the medium and emerging private groups, probably everyone else. Um, not every private group needs to do or develop a tax governance framework. However, it is clear the ATO is expecting taxpayers in the top 500 credit category to have implemented a tax governance framework. Taxpayers in the next 5,000 category, the ATO is expecting you to begin developing and implementing a tax governance framework. Um, the ATO is going through every one of the top 5,000 um, to initiate a review. And that's, it's not if, but when the ATO will initiate a review on that taxpayer. As part of the review, they're asking questions about the tax governance framework, uh, what it does, the process, the controls that you have in place, how you uh, raise tax risks and material tax matters to the board, these sorts of questions, and those responses will impact the overall risk rating that the ATO is going to give that taxpayer as part of the review. So the streamlined assurance reviews, they are focused on income tax. They don't usually directly consider FBT. However, if the ATO considers you a high risk taxpayer, or you have a non-existent tax governance framework, or just a poor one, then it's very likely you're going to be flagged for future reviews for other taxes, FBT, GST, PAYG. So just keep that in mind. Um, we've assisted a number of clients in developing these governance frameworks. Um, as I said, the ATO is definitely moving towards the expectation that most large private groups have these now. Um, there is also a very specific FBT review and audit team in the ATO. Their biggest target area is for employers that aren't registered for FBT, that don't lodge FBT returns. Um, their focus isn't random. They focus on employees where there's vehicles registered in that employer name through motor vehicle registries that the ATO has access to or data access to, and where the entity has employees. So what you disclose on your tax return and your activity statements. Tax players who have not declared car fringe benefits and FBT returns is the biggest revenue earner for the ATO in terms of audit and review activity. Um, there's also the growing focus on car parking fringe benefits, how you've calculated it, how you've calculated the lowest daily rate um, uh, to calculate taxable value. But realistically, the big one is cars for the ATO. So, recent employment taxes changes. So there's been three rulings recently um, about the treatment of travel expenditure. So the first one, tax ruling 2021-1, discusses when transport expenses are deductible to employees. It really just confirms long-standing principles that we've known. Transport expenses, expenses between home and work are not deductible. Transport expenses um, traveling between different work locations are deductible. 
Now there are different specific cases that um, the ruling also touches on, like home office, um, although the ruling doesn't discuss itinerant workers, so like sales staff. There's also tax ruling 2021 D1, or draft one. This sets the principle for determining whether an allowance is a travel allowance or a living away from home allowance. Again, the ruling confirms long-standing principles that accommodation, food and drink will generally be deductible when you're traveling for business purposes. If you're not, if you're living away from home, then it's generally not deductible for income tax purposes, but there are concessions for FBT, so the latter concessions. And the third um, document is this PCG 2021 D1. Again, outlines the ATO's proposed compliance approach in determining whether an employee is traveling. Um, as you see outlined in the slide are details of this concession. So whether the ATO will accept that an employee is traveling for business purposes, where the employees met that, that criteria. Again, I need to stress this concession in the PCG is not mandatory. That's quite a narrow fact pattern that the ATO has provided there. Certainly, if an employee is away for longer than 21 days, it's arguable that it's still business travel. You just need to document your um, or support the principles of why you've arrived at the conclusion that it is business travel still. Um, moving on to income tax rates. So going back a few years now, the 2018 federal budget, the coalition implemented this personal income tax plan where over seven years they were going to reduce individual tax rates sort of over three tranches or three periods. Um, in the 2021 federal budget, they brought stage two forward to the start of the 2021 income year. So that's the middle slide or middle um, column of the slide. Tranche three remains unchanged from the commencement date, so 1 July 2024. <coughs> um, it's just worth reflecting with these tax changes or tax rate changes, whether it's still worthwhile salary packaging, because now we'll certainly in a couple of years time, the majority of staff and employees are gonna be on a tax rate of 30% or less. And really then it's a matter of working out, well, is it still beneficial to salary package? Um, and that's particularly important too with rebateable employees, uh, employers, so employees of private schools and other non-for-profits. Non um, super guarantee rates legislated to gradually rise over the coming years. Um, from 1 July 2021, there's going to be a rate increase of 10%. There were some murmurs that that wasn't going to go ahead. I think it's probably a bit late now to change that, but we'll see what the government does. Again, with these super changes, we recommend employers just consider what these implications are. If employees are on a super inclusive package um, and their total remuneration package stays the same, then technically their salary is going to reduce because more of the remuneration is going to go to super rather than salary. That might be a difficult conversation that you have to have with the employee. With a super exclusive package, these super rate rises are just going to mean additional remuneration costs to the employer, so something that you need to budget for. Um, so payroll tax changes, we saw significant concessions um, across all the states when COVID first hit, so March and April of last year. South Australia was no exception. They quick, quickly announced a payroll tax waiver where you have Australian-wide wages of less than 4 million, a deferral if you had Australian wages over 4 million, and also an exemption for JobKeeper payments. We had the state budget in November of last year. It wasn't anything particularly new. It was more just an extension of those earlier announcements. So for example, the waiver was extended for another six months to May 2021, although there was one additional concession. So where an entity was receiving JobKeeper from 1 January 2021, so that's JobKeeper Extension 2, that's what we refer to it as, which I think finishes today or very soon. Um, if that employer was eligible for JobKeeper Extension 2, then it is to its payroll tax liability is totally waived from December to May. Um, but obviously, not as many employers were eligible to receive that um, JobKeeper subsidy. 
Um, the payroll tax rates and thresholds didn't change um, in last year's budget. While we think that's very generous of the state government, they have also recommenced review and audit activity, um, which I think is ramping up across the board, which we'll talk about now. So there are some focus areas um, in Revenue SA, other state revenue offices for payroll tax compliance activity. Grouping is always a focus area. Um, and just some key points about payroll tax grouping. It's not a choice. It's not an election that you can make or not make. It's a self-assessed determination based on the law and you're not advised by Revenue SA or State Revenue Office if you need to group. You need to work it out yourself and tell the, um, or tell all the uh, State Revenue Officers that you should be grouped from a point in time. In South Australia, there are a couple of grouping tests. It broadly comes down to two points whether the entities are related, and so that's about a, a greater than 50% control, 50% of a direct or indirect or aggregated basis. So the most common is a parent subsidiary relationship. Um, and then there's also a grouping provision where you have common employees. And that's where you have a business entity and a related employer entity. And you have co common employees um, amongst the two entities. You have to group for payroll tax then. The, the ATO, or sorry, <laughs> Revenue SA also focuses on um, other remuneration types other than salary. So wages for payroll tax purposes is not restricted to salary, it includes allowances, bonuses, fringe benefits. And then the final favourite review topic um, is employees versus contractors. So there are two common errors on this topic, two common errors that um, Revenue SA has seen. The first, the taxpayer incorrectly categorises someone as a contractor rather than an employee. And the second, that a taxpayer incorrectly believes the contractor payments are not subject to payroll tax. So on that second point, there are contractor provisions in the payroll tax law that deem payments to contractors as taxable wages for payroll tax purposes. So the rules are intended to capture contractors who provide labour services or predominantly labour services and work exclusively for one employer in a year. So unless an exemption applies, contractors are generally subject to payroll tax. There are a number of exemptions. So where they contractors only engage for less than 90 days in a year, um, they subcontract other people to come in to do the work or that the labour is secondary to the supply of materials or equipment um, in, the, in the arrangement. Again, just as a rule of thumb, unless an exemption applies, contractor payments are generally subject to payroll tax. So it really comes back to well, how do we make the determination of what's an employee and what's a contractor. It's an incredibly important um, thing to distinguish because law or the various laws impose a number of obligations on employers in relation to employees, in particular federal, state taxes and employment law. There is no universal checklist for whether someone's an employee or a contractor. It's a common law concept um, and that's the starting point for determining someone is or isn't. And common law is the basis for most of the tax laws or how they operate um, the definition of an employee. It ultimately comes down to whether someone, whether it's a contract of service or contract for service. Contract of service is a basis for the employee-employer relationship. An employee agrees to provide labour in exchange for a wage. They present to at an agreed spot at agreed time for agreed periods. A contract for service is a contractual relationship between a principal and a contractor to achieve a result. So understanding this contractual relationship and analysing it against the criteria that the courts have developed is how really how you go about making this distinction. Um, I've listed some of the factors on the slide here. I'll just touch on a few of them. So firstly, contract terms and conditions. What does the contract say? Is, it, is the person referred to as an employee or a contractor? Now, it's not definitive, it's certainly not definitive, but it does help the argument. 
um, and the distinction. Control, with an employee, the employer generally has the right to control what work's done, how it's done, where it's done. With a contractor, they can use their own initiative to achieve a result. The ability to subcontract, an employee can't generally, or they can't um, subcontract or delegate, they have to do the task they're employed for. A contractor can sub subcontract all or some of the tasks to another person. Um, with payment, an employee's remuneration is based on the hours worked. With a contractor, the remuneration or the, the fee is negotiated, generally based on a specific result. Um, the timing of payment, generally when the result's achieved or there's progress payments made. The equipment used, so tools of trade. An employee generally uses the employer's equipment. If they use their own, they're often reimbursed, so an allowance or reimbursement. Contractor has to provide their own equipment. Um, and the more significant the tools and equipment, the more likely the individual is to be an independent contractor. And there are other indicators of put there, but these are the factors that we need to go in to determine um, if it's a common law employee. So why is it important? It's because the law imposes these obligations on employers in relation to employees. Um, the relationship between a principal and a contractor is not nearly as regulated. So employers have a requirement to withhold tax from wages, pay super, um, get uh, workers cover insurance, provide leave entitlements, and they have to comply with industrial, uh, industrial laws, awards, and other regulations. Um, it's not nearly as much of a burden uh, with a contractor relationship. So there are significant risks if you get the distinction wrong. There's obviously the back pay of the employee entitlements and the taxes to the ATO. There's the de denial of income tax deductions. So from one July 2019, you don't no longer get a deduction if you don't meet your PAYG YG or super obligations. The directors may be personally liable for the company's underpaid withholding um, and super amounts under the director penalty regime. There's penalties, there's interest, there's other fair work and employment law obligations like unfair dismissal. And there's also the reputational consequences for businesses and their brands. Um, we'll probably remember examples over the last few years where a business has been named underpaying staff. It's generally not a good look. Might not, I'm sure it's not on purpose, but it does damage the brand. I guess we've gone through why there's significant consequences. It's important to acknowledge though that there is nothing wrong or sinister with them engaging a contractor. It is a legitimate practice um, of businesses, but we know that it's a favorite topic of review for the ATO and Revenue SA. So there's some suggested strategies that we have to manage that risk where you are engaging contractors. Firstly, have things in writing. So this includes a written record of the terms of the agreement, ideally executed before the engagement commences, signed by both parties. So otherwise there might be a dispute or a misunderstanding of the terms of the agreement. This could lead to the contractor going to Fair Work SA or the ATO if they disagree. Um, or equally, if there's um, not appropriate documentation, the ATO can argue an arrangement might be a particular way, which the employer then has to try and dispute. You could also implement a policy or procedure document regarding the engagement of contractors. Um, this could set out the approach for the business, um, how you engage these people. It might reduce uh, risk of errors or things slipping through the cracks. Um, but importantly as well, a policy like this demonstrates to the ATO that you're aware of the distinction, that you take it seriously, and you've got mechanisms in place to, to try and do the right thing. I think that's very, the optics of that is very important. Um, training is important too. There are various people in the business that they should be aware of this distinction. So that might be general managers, the finance team, HR team, payroll team. By providing training to these employees, they might understand the topic, be able to make informed decisions, but again, identify and flag risks when they see it. 
There are a number of online tools about making the determination for employee or contractor. Um, the ATO has a number of them. The ATO says that if you've used their tool and you use it correctly, put all the facts in correctly, print it out um, as part of the engagement processes with the contractor, then they see that as making a real general, genuine attempt to do the right thing. And they may, even if they just disagree with the conclusion, they may say, well, again, you've tried to do the right thing, rather than penalising you for what you've done in the past, we might just suggest changing the approach going forward, which is a lot cheaper and a lot better outcome um, for employers. Um, again, it's about the optics of things with these um, ATO and um, revenue office reviews. And lastly, um, what we've done a number of times with clients here is an employment taxes review. Again, it's not about seeing what's been done incorrectly in the past, just looking at what's done well now, and if there are areas or risks that we think might need to tighten up controls or processes, procedures. Again, it's a lot cheaper and efficient for an advisor to come do that than is the ATO or Revenue USA. And as we've seen, there are significant penalties, including for directors, if we don't get it right. So that's the end of my part of the presentation. I think it's back to Jamie now. Um, so thank you, James and Andrew.